So I want to turn now to my major interview for the here of the first hour here on Catholic Radio of San Diego tonight. Uh, Dr. Donald Hilton, MD, is a clinical associate professor of neurosurgery at the University of Texas Medical School in San Antonio, Texas. He's published in peer review journals in the fields of traumatic brain injury, minimally, minimally invasive spinal surgery, and most importantly for us, the neurobiology of addiction. He currently serves on the editorial board of Surgical Neurology International, and he's listed as the in the best doctors in America and as a Texas super doctor. I suppose only in Texas do they have super doctors. I don't know. And he's a member of Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society. Dr. Don Hilton, welcome to Catholic Radio San Diego. Thank you, Dr. Morse. Oh, I'm so glad that you could join us tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good, good. I'm very interested in, in for you to explain to our listeners here in San Diego uh, about your work on the study of pornography and how pornography is really and truly an addiction, just like things that we're used to thinking about addictions. Can you tell us a bit about that, Don? Sure, um, Dr. Morse. Um, let me just start with just briefly a, a little experience that I had a few years ago that might help illustrate this. So let's consider two points. Can pornography become a, a brain drug uh, of sorts? And if so, then if it's a drug, can it become addictive? So is that a, is that a fair way to kind of attack that? Well, sure, sure. That, okay. this, is, this is the way your scientific mind thinks about it. I think people just sort of think about it in a casual way, but, um, oh, yeah, it's addicted. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to M&Ms or whatever, you know, but you, you've got a real si- clear scientific question that you're answering here. Can it be a brain drug? So tell us what a brain drug is, first of all, and, uh, uh, and carry on. We, we want to hear. Sure. <clears throat> so, um, oh, a few years ago, we, I... Uh, was a missionary in Africa. We did my missionary time there years ago, and so we've had an opportunity to go back a couple of times. A few years ago, we had our family with us, and uh, we took the opportunity to do a safari up in uh, Zimbabwe. And while there, uh, we did some open-air Land Rover drives where you sit in this open-air Jeep uh, vehicle, and there's no doors, there's no windows. And the deal is, if you sit really still, then when you drive up to an animal, then you don't move, you don't jump out of the Land Rover. The animal sees this Jeep as a big, oily, smelly uh, metal animal, I guess, and, and decides it's not good to eat. And so you can actually drive right up to, say, a pride of lions within 30 feet. And you can sit there and look at these lions. And um, one day we were driving on a game drive, and we were looking for game, and our guide said, well, let's go try the adrenaline grass out. And I said, well, what's adrenaline grass? And so without telling me, he said, let me, uh, well, let's, uh, I'll show you. So we drove around through this really high grass, probably 8 to 10 feet high, right next to the banks of the Zambezi River, which is where we were staying. And as he drove through this tall grass, he stopped and he said, do you see it? And we had, you know, it was probably six or seven of us in the, in the, in the Land Rover, my family was with us, was with me, and so um, I said, no, see what? And so he drove closer, and suddenly there was this lion, and literally we were 10 feet away. Oh, my gosh. 12, 13 feet away. I'm, I'm serious. And so this lion was sitting there, and he was watching the water, you know, of course, waiting for, uh, you know, an opportunity, <laughs> you know, gazelle, uh, um, fast food, <laughs> anything to come walking by, of course, and get a drink. The lion was just waiting for some food, and of course... Uh, we all just took a, d- a double take, and we saw this lion a few feet away. And our daughter Elizabeth, who was about 12, shifted in her seat, and this lion was on its feet. Um, and the, the guy, the ranger, has a gun, but it really doesn't instill you with much confidence. <laughs> I mean, this lion, you know, you can imagine. So this lion locks and loads, and of course... Um, he walks all the way around the Land Rover and stares at us and then goes back and plops down in his same place under the adrenaline grass and goes to sleep. And I'm telling you, everyone in that Land Rover, we weren't breathing, and my heart was about to thump out of my chest when, when that happened. And I thought, adrenaline grass, got it. This is <laughs> why it's, called, mean. This is why it's called adrenaline you know, grass. And, and, and so the, my point in telling this story 
is people tend to think that to you know adrenaline is actually a drug that we as doctors have on the crash carts of, in hospitals that we use if someone's heart stops. It's called epinephrine. Right. Adrenaline, it's the same thing. Well, you know, pharmaceutical companies make it. It's in the syringes. It's ready to go in a crash cart. And so we tend to think, well, that's a drug. Of course, you take it in a syringe. You inject it. It makes your heart pound. Well, I didn't need the syringe. My brain, my body made the adrenaline when I saw that lion. And I mean, my heart was thumping out of my chest. Similarly, there's a close cousin of adrenaline called dopamine. It's another brain drug. I'll use that term. The dopamine is also important in movement systems. It it helps us walk and move. And we all know perhaps someone, at least a family member or friend or, or someone who's had Parkinson's disease, and they can't move very well. And so they take a medicine that's actually a form of dopamine that's made by a pharmaceutical company. The doctor prescribes it. And when they take that dopamine drug, then they can actually move better. So yet, if the brain makes the dopamine, it's still the same drug. It's just made by the brain. So my point in telling these stories is whether it's adrenaline or dopamine, um, these are very powerful drugs that we can either go to a pharmacist and, uh, and get, or we can simply uh, have our own brain make these drugs. It doesn't matter. It's the same chemical. It has the same effect. So, our brain is a very efficient pharmaceutical laboratory. I, I see. So, so when you're studying the science of addiction, um, the brain, in a sense, doesn't care whether you manufactured the drug yourself by an activity or, or something you viewed or something you did or you know some line you tripped over or whatever. Your, your brain doesn't care if it's that or if it came from the crash cart. A drug's a drug's a drug as far as the brain is concerned. Is that that's sort of the theme that you're, uh, that, that you're developing here? Exactly. And the reason that is important is that with viewing pornography, uh, human sexuality, these two that I happen to pick, epinephrine and dopamine, are very important in human reward and excitement and in sexuality. And there's certainly other brain chemicals that are important as well. But these two are very important. The dopamine, this drug that I just mentioned that's important in movement, is also a very important brain chemical in the reward and pleasure centers of our brains. So dopamine tells us you want that. That is an important stimulus. Um, when we see a good meal, uh, if we happen to like chocolate, whatever, dopamine incentivizes us. It tells us that we want that. And, and so these powerful brain drugs are actually produced when we uh, value a natural reward that is actually designed to help us survive, either as an individual such as food or as a species such as sexuality. And it's a good thing we have these, you know. Uh, Dr. Morse, I mean, if you think about it, um, food is a wonderful thing, and it's a good thing we want to eat it. Um, <laughs> right. So, you know? so, do- so, Dr. Hilton, are you telling us then that that when you when you eat something, you have the the pleasures of taste, and you have the pleasure of a full stomach, and you have the pleasure of maybe feeling a little more awake, um, and all of those kind of pleasures that we sort of naturally associate with eating. But that there's in addition to that, um, there's the buzz in the brain that came from the dopamine. Is that what you're telling us? That's exactly right. I see. It, it, it is. It's it's a buzz that we get, and it's a good buzz right. if it's appropriately boundaried. Right, right, right. It does. It doesn't say that it's okay to eat an entire gallon of chocolate ice cream at once. No, no, and, and of course Darn. we do get a dopamine buzz for that. Yeah. <laughs> then, you know, what's interesting, Doctor Morse, is is what happens then if these pleasure centers are overused. If we overuse them either with a substance abuse, a drug, or with a natural behavior that's overused. The effect is the same, whether it's a drug we take from outside our body, such as cocaine or opioids, or whether it's overuse of a natural stimulus such as food or sexuality. Well, this is a good time for us to sort of uh, uh, segue into the discussion of um, of pornography and and sexuality. In fact, why don't we start with with sex naturally? Let's let's put aside the um, disordered sexuality of pornography and just talk about, t- tell us, we've got a few minutes before we go to break. 
just kind of get us ready <laughs> to think about how how sex um, has this kind of natural chemical reaction that makes us want to do it again, makes us want to do it more. To get us going with that. There's been some really interesting research on on sexuality, and and of course, without it's it's some technical research, but I'll just describe it very briefly. There's um, Dr. Eric Nessler has done a lot of work on a brain chemical called delta Fos b And I don't want to get too technical here, but this is basically, this is a brain chemical that was discovered about a decade ago. And it was discovered in laboratory models, animal models of addiction. And lo and behold, it was felt to be a marker for addiction. They found it only in drug-addicted animals. We've since found that delta Fos b this, this marker for addiction in the brain, has been found in animals that exhibit um, hyper-consumption of natural rewards, such as food and sexuality. It also appears, though, that it has a lower level of, uh, that it's present in lower levels, more physiologic levels. In other words, levels that we would normally, that, that help us function naturally and normally. Yes. So delta Fos b has been found in the last couple of years in um, to be present and when stimulated by sexuality in these animals. So um, love has been called an addiction, and in a sense, it is a powerful bond. There are some tremendous bonding hormones and chemicals that are produced in the brain through sexuality. Um, I think the dopamine is certainly uh, important in terms of incentivizing the pleasure reward of human sexuality. Well, addiction, I, the way I would phrase that would be, um, can have a compelling ad- addiction. If, if I use the word addiction, then I would tend to describe something which is compulsively used despite adverse consequences. Yes. Human sexuality, when properly expressed within uh, matrimony and in marriage, is, of course, fulfilling and building and wonderful, yet it's still very compelling. So compelling can be good. <laughs> as long as it's properly, of course, boundary. Right. And in talking about those chemicals, I had mentioned dopamine. There's others. I think the there's two particular chemicals which uh, called oxytocin and vasopressin, which are produced by the brain. Now, people say, well, what are these? Um, women that have, in childbirth, uh, had difficulty um, laboring may have... Have been a, uh, remember receiving pitocin. Um, I, I throw that out there just because that's pretty common. A lot of women will say, "Well, I didn't labor well, so my doctor gave me some pitocin, and my uterus contracted." Well, that's actually oxytocin, and it's a chemical that is important in our bodies to help us actually function sexually, and it also allows breast milk to come down in lactation. The important thing about these neuropeptides, we have learned in the last few years that they are also very important in emotional bonding. We did not know that until a few years ago. And now suddenly we're learning that these very important physiologic chemicals that cause our bodies to function sexually are also very important in emotionally bonding to the object of our sexuality. So these are very important chemicals, neuropeptides and chemicals. And, you know, in, in something like, say, pornography and, and someone that, become, that self-stimulates to pornography, I believe the brain is confused, particularly when these powerful hormones are awakened in that context. So now let me I- I- explain this to me because I've often wondered this. Okay, if you um, – oxytocin can be stimulated by touch and, and phys- physical closeness and so on. And, and yes. as women, you know, we, can, we have that sort of relaxing that we do after, after a sexual encounter or even when we're nursing our babies because oxytocin floods, floods us when we're nursing and everything. We, we, we attach. We attach to who's ever there, you know. Um, but, but if, if you're having sex by yourself um, with a, or with a computer screen or something, um, is it oxytocin that gets going at that point, Dr. Hilton? Or is it, it, it maybe more? It may be more vasopressin in males. Uh huh. Um, or is it? Close. Or is it the uh, dopamine reaction that's that's happening? That's what well, I'm a little. Uh huh. Okay. Both. It, it is both. The dopamine, of course, is is. It doesn't really care whether it's food or sex or gambling 
whatever that natural reward is that incentivizes us to survive, dopamine tells us you want that. Of course, oxytocin and vasopressin are specific to, to human bonding and sexuality. And, um, and so it, it's more of a cocktail. In fact, Judith Reisman uh, described, used that word erototoxin a few years ago. And I think I, I like it because um, they're physiologic chemicals in our brains. In other words, they're chemicals that are placed there for normal use in our brains. And yet if they're used in the wrong context, uh, they're not balanced properly, then they become toxic to our lives, to our function, to our emotions, to our ability to, to love and to function. Right. So if, you, if you're being sexual inside the context of marriage, your body is trying to attach to the person you're married to and the person you're having sex with. And all, so the body is building on the emotion and building on the sacramental um, spiritual nature of the union, if, if, if I could put it that way. You know, in the, in the Catholic Church, we believe that uh, the human person is meant for love, you know, and, and this thing you're describing um, is, really just, is really pointing to the fact that it's actually built into the body, that we're attaching to our sex partners in a, in a very natural and wholesome way. But if, if it takes place outside of matrimony, then, of course, the person you're trying to attach to is maybe not suitable or you're not, um, you're, not, you're not really committed to the person. It's almost like you're telling a lie with your body in a certain sense because you're not actually committed to them, but your body's trying to commit to them. Is that the sort of thing that you're talking about here? Is there another feature to it? Or I, I really like the way that you, you put that, Dr. Morris, the, the word sacrament, sacramental, in other words, consecration to, to God and and really, that's the, what he intended sexuality to be, is, is we believe, just as you do, that it is a holy sacrament, a, a, a bonding of two souls in, in, in holy matrimony that allows them then to, to, um, to bond in, in a very sacred and personal way. And so uh, pornography is a counterfeit. It's the opposite of intimacy. Yes. It takes that symbol, that physical symbol, and... Uh, by definition, by the very fact that it's on a screen, uh, destroys the intimacy that it imitates. So tell us, just before we go into that, because I I know this, what you're saying is completely right, Um, you know, there really is something quite unnatural about um, sex with a computer screen, you know, for want of a better way to put it. But um, walk us through, if you can, kind of the physiology of what happens when a person becomes addicted to pornography. Well, l- let me talk about addiction for just a moment. Okay. Because I think this is a really important thing to understand. Um, many therapists have resisted using the word addiction with sexuality. And there's a reason for that, and we don't have time to go into all of that, but I, I will briefly mention that. It's important that we at least have a basis of understanding. Alfred Kinsey um, We've all heard of, or we may have heard of, of the Kinsey Institute, of his book that he published in 1948, uh, Human Sexual or Sexuality in the Human Male. And many consider him the, say, the father of academic sexuality. Um, he's still widely quoted. Yep. Um, academically, uh, the um, legal uh, systems will use him. Uh, judicial rulings will reference him as precedent. And yet, Kinsey's work has been exposed to any who have any objectivity in this matter as a, as a complete fraud um, in, in the work that he did. It just it is, and there's Judith Reisman has written her book, uh, Sexual Sabotage and Kinsey Crimes and Consequences. It, it's easy to, to learn about Kinsey's fraud, but Kinsey, from 48 on, in his second book, Sexuality and the Human Female, and I think it was 53, um, when he began to, to publish this and to basically take human sexuality out of the sacred, the emotional, the human bonding aspect, and basically turn the world into a masturbatory object. That's really what Kenzie did. It was right after that, in I think 55, that, that Hugh Hefner uh, published his first uh, issue of Playboy, and he said that if Kenzie is the prophet, I am his pamphleteer. Mm-hmm. He was a big cheerleader for Kenzie, uh, Hefner was. And so sexuality then became this recreational medium, simply recreation, 
devoid of human emotion or attachment. Well, early on, they didn't just start with, with entertainment and media. They immediately jumped into academia from the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University. And, of course, uh, the academics then made sexuality and pornography more of a, ma- a matter of enlightenment. In other words, um, are you a prude? Can you accept sexuality for um, and, and look at this in a more academic sense? And so it was really almost a, a form of academic int- of intimidation uh, with sexuality then being hijacked, as it were. And so today, um, for instance, if a person wants to be certified by ASEC, which is the American Sex uh, Therapist Society, they're required to, um, I think it's 10 to 12 hours, uh, to attend a, a seminar for 10 to 12 hours called an SAR, a Sexual Attitude Readjustment Seminar. And that's basically 10 to 12 hours of hardcore pornography um, between humans of all kinds, animals, whatever. And the idea is to readjust the budding therapist's sexual attitudes. And I'm sure it does that, <laughs> 10 to 12 hours of hardcore pornography. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let, let, me get, let me get this straight. What you're, what you're telling me is that in, in order to be a member of this society, one has to become desensitized to the very thing you're supposed to be a therapist about. Well, yes, that, that's exactly right. It's called ASEC, and there's others that, that also require SARs. There's a good book that describes this, Wendy Maltz's book, The Porn Trap. Wendy Maltz is a sex therapist, and she participated and was trained in SAR and used pornography then in her therapy, say for frigid couples who might come into her and say, we, uh, the spark has gone from our marriage. She is typical of many therapists who would use the pornography then to try to, uh, to stimulate couples to be able to function sexually again. She has since changed. She now believes pornography is extremely harmful. And she did not come to this point of view through any moral, uh, to my knowledge, moral or um, religious uh, It was basis. just experience. Her experience told her that this was not working. We are, yes, we are emotional creatures. Humans, you know, if we put a prisoner in solitary confinement, it's terrible. Um, babies that don't have they don't bond to their mothers, don't develop. I mean, we are not meant to be alone. We are emotional creatures. Pornography says that there is no emotion in human sexuality, which is the most intimate act that we can participate in. So it is, it is a lie. But going back to that addiction thing. Yeah, that's right. So, so yeah, the, the, the I, thrust I, of what I, you're I, telling well, us here is that, is that, is that this whole um, kind of combination of social and academic movement was something that, um, that by, its, by its nature desensitized people. Uh, the people who were participating in it became desensitized to the emotional and social aspect of it and turned it into either recreation or um, or uh, an academic exercise, which which the academic exercise part of it was almost a cover uh, for for what was being taken away, namely the emotional part. Am I am I following you right there? Yes, you are. And okay. the reason I mention this is, you will still find many academicians, particularly the psychology side of things, that will. Uh, be apologetic with regard to pornography and say, well, it's not I addictive. I it see. Maybe it, it can become an impulse control disorder, but it's not an actual brain addiction. And the reason they say that is, can you imagine? Oh. They, well, they use it in their practices, oh. uh, Dr. Morrison. So how can they say, well, I use an addictive medium to treat my patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're they're not unbiased uh, observers of this thing at this point. No. Yeah, they're deeply committed to it. So so t- tell us more about why you think it is an addiction. <laughs> I'm right. sure. Okay. I'm sure. <clears throat> Just if if you're interested, there's a good point counterpoint in surgical neurology. I wrote um, uh, Clark Watts, who's a neurosurgeon, who's also an attorney, UT um, Law School, is just retired. He and I wrote a paper titled Pornography Addiction and Neuroscience Perspective, published as an editorial in a neuroscience journal. And we were uh, uh, countered by a, a more apologetic pornography is not addictive. It's more of a, it can be an impulse control disorder. So then we wrote a rebuttal, and it's a fairly, I think, if, if someone would like to kind of see where the argument goes, 
from therapists who are more apologetic with regard to the science, this would be a good thing to read. So you'd Google my name with uh, and in fact, there's an, a website with uh, Gary Wilson and Marnie Robinson called Your Brain on Porn, and it's a good website. It's not pornography. They're actually fighting pornography, okay? Okay. But well. that website is a good website. They actually detail all of the papers that published, the back-and-forth papers uh, that we wrote back-and-forth with these uh, therapists who were defending uh, the concept that pornography is not addictive. Well, it's interesting because... Uh, the, the evidence is substantial that natural addictions are real and do exist. And, and so we detailed that in, in the research that talks about not just sex, but food and gambling. All of these are natural addictions. Fascinatingly, just this August, which is only a few months after our papers published, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, um, which is a group, a uh, national group of physicians who treat addiction, came out with a new definition of addiction. This definition was four years in the making, involved over 80 experts. These are, and, and I emphasize, these are not psychologists. Right, um, these are the docs. These are the, these are these are the MDs, yeah. They, they have to be able to treat addiction, not only, say, with a, from a counseling aspect, but also withdrawal, be able to prescribe drugs to help the brain, to help the body. So these so, are medical doctors. So what they come up with for their definition, Dr. Dr. Hilton? Fascinatingly, they said two things, basically. And you can look up this. It's called ASAM, Addiction, the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Go, go look it up yourself in the long definition. One, addiction is a chronic disease of the brain. They use the word disease of the brain. So it's not about the behavior. It's about the brain. Okay. Involving the reward, motivation, and memory systems of the brain. So those, the reward, motivation, memory system of the brain is broken. It is physically and chemically damaged by addiction. Two, and more importantly in our context, for the first time, ASAM's definition says that addiction is not restricted to substances but includes overconsumption of natural rewards, specifically listed are food, sex, and gambling. Wow. Wow. I have so many questions for you, Dr. Hilton. I don't know how I'm going to get them all in here in this last segment, but one of the things I really want to know, um, if, you, if, you can, if, if this is known, I don't know if anyone knows it, but if anyone knows it, you are the one who knows it, and that is how addictive is sexual activity, how addictive is pornography compared to other kinds of addictions? Because a lot of times people think about certain drugs as being much more addictive than others, like you use it once and that's it, or other things like, oh, it takes you a little while to get addicted or whatever. How does pornography use fit into that kind of spectrum of, um, of, of how addictive something can be? You know, that's, that's a good question. I think one of the interesting things that the ASAM definition also pointed out was that up to 50% of the population may be more predisposed to addiction. And when I say addiction, that means addiction of all kinds. Uh -huh. Because what, what that means is that that person's reward system has, uh, to put it kind of simply, a, a sensitivity to dopamine. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. And so whether it's a drug addiction or sexuality or food, uh, people that become addicted tend to switch hit. We've all seen someone trying yes. to quit smoking who eats, overeats, et cetera. Right. Or who are addicted to multiple things at the same time. That's exactly right. Right. So, so that sexuality, has to... because it's such a powerful drive, it actually produces the largest and highest natural dopamine spike in the brain. Now, of course, uh, cocaine... Uh, methamphetamine, these are going to produce a super spike that's even more than sexuality. Um, but the effect is the same. It's just a higher spike with the drug. The sexuality, though, produces the highest natural spike of dopamine in the brain. And so as far as addiction goes, you know, do we have an addiction meter? Right. right. That, I guess kind of what I'm asking. Yeah. I don't know if that's um, right. You know, we don't. There's no way I can quantify that and say it's more addictive than this or that. I will say uh, my wife and I work with uh, in, in our in our um, in our religious uh, arena uh, with twelve step groups, helping set these groups up uh, so that individuals and couples who have uh, struggled with sexual addiction, either say from the addiction itself or 
betrayal uh, through the, the hurt and pain, then there's groups where they can come together uh, based on 12-step formats. 12 steps says in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, right. modified right. For, for sexual addiction. And so um, just from, from these experiences, um, sexuality is being such a powerful brain drug it certainly appears that it's uh, it can be addictive for many people in a in a very quick hook in a very deep hook. And so, just I, I think it's a quick and a deep set. So 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 in other words, in in the olden times, people would tell uh, young people to stay completely away from sexual activity, and they would tell people, you know, to they they didn't want people to become aroused. Prematurely, you know, they didn't. They didn't want young people to to start experiencing too much sexual arousal, so they were very you know, trying to guard them um, from from that kind of feeling. And what you're telling me, it's it seems like Dr. Hilton, um, is that um, there was wisdom in that. <laughs> there was wisdom in protecting them from that because for for some people, um, they could become addicted very quickly. Absolutely, and in fact. Um Jason Carroll's article uh, in their paper, which was published in the Journal of Adolescent Research, looked at, I think it was six colleges, about 800 students, and found that about 90 per, almost 90% of young men are regularly viewing pornography, about 50% of them weekly, and about 20% of them daily or every other day, and about a third of college-age women are regularly viewing pornography now. And this is digital streaming. This is you know, sexual intercourse, um, this isn't just pictorial. This is sound. This is much more imprinting in terms of having an impression, in terms of rewiring the brain. And the brain does rewire. Our, our brain is plastic. It can be molded. It is molded by what we learn. Yes, that's a very interesting point. That was something else I was going to ask you. Do you think it's the case that the uh, online digital pornography that we're, that everybody's exposed to today, is that by nature more addictive than the, the old um, you know, playboys that come to your house in a brown paper bag or whatever, or a brown wrapper or whatever? And it sounds like you're telling me, yes, that the digital, that the, that the, the, the digital kind of pornography that people are dealing with now is, in fact, more addictive. It's having a bigger impact on the brain. Am I am I right in in that? I think I think everyone agrees that it is. Uh, uh-huh. Patrick Carnes' book uh, about in the shadows of the net about cyber addiction with the internet. Um, I think everyone agrees that this this new medium it, it's such. Well, think about it. You know, taking a drug is neurologically fairly passive. You know, a person say, mainlines, uh, you know, snort some cocaine or mainlines heroin or whatever, and it's basically a physical act, and then they wait for the effect to hit their brain. With pornography, it's a very active learning process, and our brains want to learn something. So there's this constant clicking and searching, and, and so it's an extremely active learning process neurologically. And so I think it's the perfect storm in a negative way for learning something very harmful and very destructive. In fact, Malinka and Cower, uh, who are at Stanford, published a paper on, on the brain science of the actual cellular mechanisms of addiction. And in that paper, they said addiction represents a, or is a pathologic yet powerful form of learning and memory. And, and so the, um, it, 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 does this also account for the fact that sometimes people become so desensitized to what they're seeing that they're looking for something more outrageous or something more intense or something more powerful or more frequent or something? Is this, is this part of how that's happening, Dr. Hilton? That, that's exactly right, and that's part of, of uh, the desensitization with dopamine receptors that occurs in all addiction, including pornography addiction. And that's why pornographers design a, a pornography that is as Steve Hirsch, the vivid pornographer there in, in California, said, he wants to make pornography that is harder and harder and harder and harder. In other words, it's just uh, it has to to keep the interest of the customer because they're being desensitized. Yes. Now, you know, a few minutes ago you said something about twelve step programs, and we don't have that much time left in the program. I don't want to leave people hanging because I'm sure there are people listening here who are saying, "Right on, right on, Doctor Morse, why are you bugging this guy? I know it's addictive. I'm addicted. My husband's addicted. It's ruining my life." What do we tell people, Doctor Doctor Hilton? What, what? Where do people go for help? It. It needs to be treated with the sa- exactly the same emphasis, treatment, and 
and, uh, and time, effort that any substance abuse would be treated with. In other words, we can't expect if someone has an alcohol or cocaine addiction that they're just going to pray alone. Of course, prayer is very important, but that they're just going to pray and just wish it away right. or just stop. Uh, they need, of course, therapy, counseling, and 12-step support has been shown to be extremely helpful. There are, for instance, SA groups for sexual addiction. It's called, just like AA, well, this is SA. And there, I'm sure, uh, in fact, I know very strong in, in San Diego and in all cities in California, these are 12-step groups for individuals to go and to gain support and strength. There are S anon groups, just like Al Anon, for family members of those who have struggled with sexual addiction, have been harmed from the effects of their loved one's addiction, where they can go and meet others in a 12-step format and gain strength and healing based on a higher power. Now, there is a program here in San Diego in anticipation of our uh, talk here tonight, um, Dr. Hilton. I, I consulted with some of my colleagues in Catholic Radio, and there is a program here called Unleashed San Diego, um, unleashedsandiego.com. People can go there and um, get information about this particular group, which I th- I'm pretty sure has a meeting in 12-step type of format in the background. And also a couple of weeks ago, my colleagues on Catholic Radio, uh, Kent Peters and uh, et al., who do the program program on Wednesday nights. Um, they have a program every Wednesday night called Setting Things Right, and they've done a couple of shows on pornography addiction. So if you want even more information, more detailed, specific information, people here in San Diego can go look at the Catholic Radio archives and look on the Wednesday night show, look for uh, the Setting Things Right program. And just a couple of weeks ago, they did a program on, on pornography addiction that talked about local resources that people can can tap into. But uh, Dr. Hilton, I especially wanted you to come to talk more about this physiological aspect, which I know you've added a lot to, you know, whatever was done, uh, you, you've certainly added a whole lot of, uh, of, of knowledge and information to people. Um, you know, you were also talking about um, um, S- 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 anon, sex, sex Addicts Anonymous. But th- there's the program for the, for the people who are themselves addicted, and then there's a program for the people who are living with them, who are family members. I want to just mention that um, in one of the programs that we did at the Ruth Institute, we have a, we have a summer program for, for college students where they, we teach them every aspect of the marriage issue. And uh, one year we did a – we always have a, a roundtable, open discussion on sex on campus and so on. And one year the, the, topic, the topic goes wherever the kids want it to go, you know. But one year they started talking to us about pornography addiction. And the, the young women talked about how awful it was for them to know that they were competing with the computer screen. Some of the young people talked about seeing their parents struggle with pornography addiction, what it was like to see their mothers so wounded by their father's addiction. So there are there really are many, many victims uh, to pornography addiction. This is not a so-called victimless crime, that there are a lot, people are doing a lot of things um, ignoring the negative consequences of what they're doing, ignoring the impact that they're having on others. I think that's a characteristic of addiction, don't you think, Dr. Dr. Hilton? That you... Absolutely, Dr. Morse, it is. It's, uh, addiction is basically continued engagement in a self-destructive behavior. And uh, despite these adverse consequences destroying the person's life, they cannot stop. And can't stop is, is the key thing. Without outside help, without outside support, They can't stop. Now, the beauty of it is, as you've said, there in San Diego, you have support groups. And we, um, in in the work that we've done, we've met many in in recovery. And uh, I'm, I can say uh, absolutely that uh, can a person be healed from pornography addiction? Yes, I personally believe that there must be a spiritual component to healing from addiction. I think that's right. And I think the evidence is on the, is on the point of that, don't you think, Dr. Hilton? I mean, it, in other words, when people study alcohol, recovery from alcohol addiction, um, the, the 12-step programs win hands down, you know, because of, the, because of the spiritual component. You know, there's one thing we haven't mentioned that, I, that we've got a minute and a half, and I've just got to say this. One of the problems with addiction is that we lie to ourselves, you know, when we get addicted, one of the most characteristic things we do is we just lie, lie, lie. <laughs> we just, oh, I can stop any time. Oh, I'm not really doing that. Oh, why are you so, so upset with me? It's not such a big deal. Lying is a central part of the addictive process. Would you agree with that, Dr. Hilton? It is, and that's why step 
ones and one and two of the twelve steps basically are honesty, our powerlessness and coming to honesty, where the person absolutely decides they cannot do it alone, they have a problem, and they must seek help from a higher source. And that's the start. D- Dr. Don Hilton, I am so pleased that you have been able to spend this past hour with us. It's been so informative, the people of San Diego. I really appreciate your contribution here. Um, and we we need to wrap up this first hour of Catholic Radio of San Diego. I've been talking with Dr. Don Hilton, an expert on the physiology and neuropsychology and neurophysiology of pornography addiction, and I hope that this program has been helpful to you. If you like this program and and have people you want to share it with, go to the archives of Catholic Radio of San Diego, or you can go to the podcast page of the Ruth Institute at ruthinstitute.org. You've just been listening to Dr. J from the front lines of the culture war on Catholic Radio of San Diego, where she and Dr. Don Hilton discuss the addictive nature of pornography. Check out catholicradioofsandiego.com or look us up on Facebook for more information on the show. Our website is www.ruthinstitute.org and we're also on Facebook. Like the Ruth Institute or Dr. Jennifer Robeck Morse pages for updates. Our podcasts can be found online at ruthinstitute.libsyn.com and iTunes. And as always, they're under a Creative Commons license. If you've enjoyed them, please share them with friends. The Ruth Institute is a nonprofit educational organization devoted to bringing hope and encouragement for lifelong married love.